This edition of the Heart of Giving podcast is honoring the BBB Luminaire Award for Service winners. The award honors individuals who prioritize philanthropy and have made a meaningful impact through their charitable initiatives. The award celebrates qualities of compassion, volunteerism, and community leadership. We hope you enjoy this episode. You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here, we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. I'm so happy to have this particular episode because it follows on to something we created this year within the BBB system. The Wise Giving Alliance is part of the BBB system, and it is the Luminaire Award for Service. This is an idea that I had to sort of go in line with what we're trying to achieve with the podcast, with the Heart of Giving podcast, and that is to hold up people in communities who are doing great work supporting those communities in various ways. We thought it would be really nice if the BBB could actually begin to honor these individuals. And so we started with the Great Western and Pacific BBB, and they have done a terrific job identifying our winners this year. And as part of being a winner, of this Luminaire Award for Service, they also get to be a guest on the podcast. So today our guest is Emily Berliner, and Emily is the Chief Operating Officer and Founder of EBO Consulting. And her consulting business focuses on small businesses, which is obviously consistent with what the Better Business Bureau does with small businesses. But we were drawn to Emily because of her work with nonprofits as well. And we're going to find out about that work speaking with her today. But join me in congratulating Emily for being the first recipient to join this podcast. Emily, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. Thank you so much, Art. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very humbled and honored to be speaking with you and uh, to have received this award. It's kind of everything, the culmination of a lot of my uh, life's work thus far has been surrounding nonprofit land. And (laughs) it's um, pretty awesome to be honored for that. So thank you for having me. That's our pleasure. Well, you indicate that your philosophy is to approach community service, volunteerism, and philanthropy as a consistent part of someone's schedule. Giving back means so many different things to different people, but for you, it means making time to support or volunteer and to show kindness and compassion. So I want to talk about that. Where does that philosophy come from? I mean, it's very easy to just say, I'm in business. I want to focus on business. And if you're a small business, Lord knows you're busy. You're doing so many different things at once. And it's very difficult to find time to do other things, particularly volunteer and give away your time. But you do that. Where does this philosophy come from? I don't know if it's rooted in anything specific. I think I was 
raised in a very giving back environment. My dad's a physician, so he was spent, you know, countless hours working. And so I think growing up and seeing my mom's a nurse. So I think I just saw two very proactive working parents who really didn't take a lot of time for themselves. And I know, you know, it's a different generation, but as I grew up, I knew that I was embedded in me to, you know, give back, to go, you know, to be a, a either a civic leader or a working for a nonprofit or a governmental organization or, you know, being in the military because all my family's in the military. So any of those avenues seemed like, the only way to do things and the only way to uh, to be a good citizen. And obviously that's evolved over the years, but my ultimate feeling when I wake up every day is like, I want to see somebody light up when I give them something. And that's not physical. That's not a tangible all the time. It's not a dollar to somebody on the corner. That's a comment. That's mostly a, something that's going to build them up that day, even if it's just a compliment or a remark that made them feel a little less, you know, grumpy or down or sad. I mean, it's not false compassion. It's true compassion, but it's, I think it's so normal for me to be like that. I think that people kind of expect me to be their person so that I get a lot of people coming up to me and expressing like really frustrating things. And then they know I'm going to respond with, you know, kindness, and I'm going to listen. And so sometimes even just at that level, it really does just resonate through me. And so I know I can take that to another level, obviously on a personal level with what I earn, but then up to a higher level with the business, because then you can start, you know, really donating at a, at a level that is more not impactful per se. I mean, it is, but it just, it, it touches more people and hopefully that's, that's the kind of end game. But yeah, I, it, I think just growing up in that environment was probably where the philosophy really got embedded in me, but um, also just, you know, a lot of life experiences, seeing a lot of things internationally, doing a lot of travel and having a really wide open mind, understanding that every single organization that is in a nonprofit or donation charitable organization exists for a reason. And the reasons are generally good and positive. And, you know, I want to help everybody, but it's also just, it's amazing to see how many of us are truly, you know, driven by doing good and seeing things happen without focusing on the dime. So it's, um, yeah, I guess that's the best way to say. <laughs> I want to just also feature what you said uh, about small gifts. Just giving a little bit can can have an impact. Was there anything in particular that gave you that understanding or that appreciation? Is there anything in your life that said, you know what, even if it's a small thing, I'm going to do it? And you mentioned being able to just say something to someone, things that are not tangible. How did you come to realize that that type of giving can also be very, very powerful? And for those of you who listened to one of my previous episodes, a few episodes ago, I had Dr. Amit Kumar on the show. And he is a, a PhD at the University of Texas, and he's done some studies on generosity and discovered that small acts of giving actually mean more to people than we think they do. And it's kind of a remarkable thing because when we make those small gifts, those people really light up, the people who receive them in ways that we don't think. But more importantly, they're more likely to give to others. And so I was left with this thought that if we all just took out a few dollars or a dollar and gave it to someone, the ripple effect of that could be stunning. It could literally change the world just through compassion and generosity. When when people give us something, we not only value the amount of the gift, but we value the, the fact that someone gave it 
which gives it sort of a multiplier. But that seems to be part of who you are. You know, you you identified really early that small gifts can make a big difference to people. And so you just do this. I think that's wonderful. There's um, a lot to it that I think stems from being at, so you know, you can probably relate to this. So when you're young, maybe the first time you ever went to a, a city zoo. And I don't know, I grew up for a couple of years in Ohio and Cincinnati, and they have this amazing zoo. And I remember going to the zoo and seeing the little clear glass Pyrex bo- or, you know, uh, whatever it's called, boxes where you would put money in as a donation to the World Wildlife Foundation, I think it was. And I thought, oh, look at that. That is the coolest thing that you can give back or give money and help the animals. And I just was astounded by the idea of supporting animals because I loved animals. I was, you know, six, seven years old. It was a very exciting time to love animals. And I think that was kind of like the stepping stone. And then as I grew up and realized that putting money in a little basket or a little box or whatever doesn't really give me enough. It kind of made me feel like I wasn't sure where that was going to, where that money was going to go. Even though it was just the dollar, I I still felt like I wanted to know like what that impact was going to be. So I grew up and evolved my thinking to make sure I could focus at least locally as I've been back in Alaska on local nonprofit organizations where I can be involved in some way with other things beyond just the monetary donation. But I mean, also in my line of work, actually supporting them on a, on a professional level. But going back to the comment about giving small, I mean, at the end of the day, that $1, it can spread and spread and spread. But I think the simple act of reaching out, simple act of having that conversation Sometimes I'll reach out to an individual um, executive director and just try to kind of pick their brain as far as what their goals are and how we might be able to help them reach those goals and point them in the right direction to like, for example, somebody that might not need our services, but they might need a fundraising expert. So I would refer them. It's not about just a kind word, but there's other things. It's like, we see you. We understand that there's something going on that's challenging you. The answer is not to throw money at it ever, but there's a way to, that we can help in a different way. So all of a sudden you're, you're really giving back in a, in another, through another avenue that's um, pretty remarkable. And I, that's kind of how I've blended my personal giving back world with now my professional giving back world and also added in the ability to help support our business model by working with sustainable nonprofits that are able to budget us into their funding. So yeah, I hope that answers that question. (laughs) No, you did great. So one thing I want to do is hold up your father who was in the military and just thank him for his service. We've had a number of generals, retired generals who are doing other things now on the podcast as well. And we always like to acknowledge and hold up that service. And it just seems that of the guests we've had, their military service is very much in line with their their outlook on life. I remember interviewing Al Lenhart, General Al Lenhart, he was an ambassador too. I should mention that he was an ambassador to Tanzania. When he retired from the military, he took on a number of assignments in the nonprofit sector. And I would ask him, well, why did you move to nonprofits? You could have very easily gone to become a government contractor or, you know, like many of them do in the the defense industry, they become very wealthy, which is good for them in the defense industry. But Al said that he had a difficult time turning down anyone who asked him for anything. And it was because of his mother. His mother would tell them that theirs was a world in which they had to give back. And 
and he never forgot that. So his his career, his life has been one of service. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of what you're experiencing is a result of your father's uh, influence, mm-hmm. uh, although you might tell me differently, but I wouldn't be surprised if you told me it was. Definitely. So I have um, my biological father, who's the dad I'm referring to, who's in the, who was in the military, who's a physician. And then my stepfather, who passed away a few years ago, was with me from a very young age as well. On my stepdad's side, he was a business owner, and he was also one of the sh- the most generous human beings I've ever met, just both from a monetary perspective, but also from a time perspective. Like he gave time to everybody who asked for it. And sometimes those who didn't, because he just, that's who he was. It was just, yeah. through, it li- I mean, it lived in him. So he was a huge impact. And then my, my dad, even through everything he was doing, he was essentially, so my mom was finishing nursing school. He was with me and my two brothers. So he was raising us pretty much kind of solo for a few years. He even, beyond working, you know, 48-hour, 72-hour shifts in the ER, which they could do back then, he went over to Vietnam and he was trying to start a, an NGO, a non-governmental organization over there to provide emergency vehicle services because at the time wow. they didn't have ambulances in, this, in the country. And he had worked over there numerous times in the past with other organizations in a medical capacity because he was in the, uh, he was a medic during, in 1972 during the war. So he wanted to give back from day one when all of that transpired. And his goal was to get this set up and make this really big impact in, you know, hopefully throughout the country. And he had the right contacts. He had the right everything, but his pockets were not deep enough. And unfortunately, just financially could not uphold the the organization any longer. But And that's, that's to me, not a failure in any way, shape, or form. But No, it's not a failure at it, all. It happens. Yeah, absolutely it does. So I think going back to your comment about being influenced by, you know, my father, by both my fathers in a big way, but I think seeing my dad's efforts to do something that was so kind of out of left field for a lot of people, a lot of people didn't understand why he was going there, you know, what drove him there. And of course, people would argue there's stuff home, you know, there's local organizations that need more help and that kind of a thing. But I think the bigger picture thing is it made me see that giving back on that scale is is possible, that you could really have an impact at that level, but start on your own in a small way. And that's what he did. He just worked his way. He used his network. He used his contacts and in a good, you know, in a very productive way so that he could come into the country and basically pitch this idea. And unfortunately, like I said, didn't pan out. But that idea, I'm certain, blossomed into the existing situation they have there, which is now, you know, a pretty solid system. It's not great, but at least they have something. So, yeah. You know, I, I want to just I want to follow up on what you said because a lot of times people um, get started in nonprofits and they're just inspired to do something. It's not because they had a business model that laid out all the particulars for how it would go, and that there were investors that were lined up to support it and. Like you would in a business, you know, in a business, you have a bank, you might want to go to the bank, get some financing or your family saved up financing or you can get others to invest and because they know they're going to get something in return. In nonprofits, we just sort of have this moment of inspiration because we see something that we want to change and we start an organization and it doesn't make sense. It makes absolutely no sense logically or from a business standpoint. But yet, how many of these organizations are now succeeding or have demonstrated something to us that we are now succeeding with, even though that thing didn't succeed, right? It's the inspiration, I think, that 
drives the creation of nonprofits beyond reason. And I know it, a lot of people are going to listen to this podcast and say, this guy's a nut. He's <laughs> crazy. What, what, what is he talking about? Of course, they have to have. Yes, they have a they have a business plan, but they don't have anything in the way of resources, usually, when a lot of these organizations get started. And yet they persist. They find ways to accomplish things. They get others involved as volunteers. And over time, they become institutions that are really contributing and making a difference. And most organizations don't start off the year having any clue where their funding is coming from in the next year. Yeah. Think about that. It's a big deal. So, you know, it's quite a remarkable thing that we do in the nonprofit sector. And since you mentioned that, I thought I would add that. But a question I have for you, Emily, is how does it make you feel? You know, we've talked a lot about trying to do something to make others feel well. How does it make you feel when you give back? I genuinely feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. There's this sense of just gratefulness. I mean, as kind of cliche or cheesy as that might sound, there's just a a sincere gratefulness that I'm in a position to do that. Even when I've been financially down, I've still given a little back because it's, I mean, I hate to say it's rewarding in that, I mean, but it is. It gives me a sense of of really like achievement, which isn't the type of achievement I think you might be thinking about. It's more achieving for others. But again, I I genuinely feel like it it just, it warms me. It makes, it makes me feel whole. It gives me a sense of, of like, a, like I said, gratitude and that I can, that I can do that. And it propels me forward and motivates me to continue the same path because obviously I know I'm going to feel good doing it. But I think that those feelings per se aren't, you know, that's not the reason I do it, but it certainly helps. <laughs> it's empowering. Yeah. I mean, people don't quite understand how empowering it is. It's something that you can control. Mm-hmm. It's maybe the one thing in our lives that we absolutely have control over. True. Giving something, right? We can decide to give. Regardless of how much we have, even if it's a little, as you mentioned, we can give advice. We can just tell someone, you know, if we're religious, that I'm going to pray for you. Mm -hmm. Or if we are just a human who maybe doesn't have a faith, we can say, I hope things work out for you. Mm -hmm. Or just be encouraging of someone's activities, right? It makes a whole difference for for that person. And for you, it's something that you've done and you have the power to do that. So I wanted to just mention it. Emily, So let's talk about your business and how it contributes to the work of nonprofits and what part of your work are you actually giving away in support of organizations and maybe a story of a particular group that you work with? Absolutely. I um, operate the business called EBO Consulting, and we are a, a local development consulting team. We support both nonprofits, governmental organizations, local, state, and federal as needed, and mostly local and state businesses, but we can serve on a national level. So when I started the business, the not the end game, but the goal was to help people get organized. I thought people are just kind of, and it was very vague in my mind. I just thought, oh, I can, I can help people get organized because that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years because <laughs> I was in, in an administrative capacity, either as an office manager or as an executive assistant or as an executive like assistant director, project manager type situations where I was very embedded in the administrative environment and the operational environment. And so I knew how to get people's businesses to work properly. But the cool thing was I was also working in those previous years for mostly nonprofit organizations. So it really allowed me to 
to step in and get my feet wet. And then I did some professional certification for nonprofit management and escalated into starting the business again with the, t- with the idea of organizing and being that person because <laughs> I started solo initially and then it evolved and it evolved not quickly, but I saw the opportunity to expand on my experience and my expertise with nonprofits and really support those who want to either start or want to get involved or whatever. So beyond just finding potential clients, I was also connecting through local organizations and community groups on Facebook and trying to really just engage the community as a whole. And as we grew and evolved and, you know, started increasing revenue and were able to sustain, like, for example, a social media manager who we now have, we were able to focus on community nonprofits in a bigger way so we can do shout outs and acknowledgements and point people in the right direction for events that are happening to local nonprofit organizations. So it's become embedded not only in just general practice, but in how we interact with the community. It's always bringing it full circle back to the nonprofits and how they're the such a stronghold within our state. They're, I mean, a huge, huge part of Alaska is the nonprofit sector. So beyond just the giving then and, and kind of reaching out, our service model has evolved and able to enable us to do startup nonprofits. So as far as a nonprofit wanting to incorporate and getting everything, their ducks in a row on that, we can facilitate that process. But we also do what I would say like nonprofit business management. So for example, we have long-term contracts with variety. Uh, I think right now we have with five different entities that are nonprofit organizations who are um, under pretty s- consistent flat funding. So they do have the ability to hire contractors in our regard. These are all, or some actually a couple of the organizations do have staff, a couple of them do not. So it's kind of a variety of things, but we are able to support their everyday administrative and operational back-end needs because especially for the folks that don't have staff, they're relying on their board and their board members are already volunteers most of the time. And (laughs) then they are stretched so very thin. So we try to just create some breathing room for folks and some stability and foundational things that can be applied moving forward. And whether or not that means we stay on board, we know that we've left them with a a good process and procedure in place that will keep them afloat and keep them moving in the right direction. So all of that has kind of been part of our everyday practice in that realm. So nonprofits are Every single day we man- we do something related to one of our clients in the nonprofit sector, or we do something associated with another nonprofit, whether it be resubscribing to something in order to donate that way or whatever it might be. So it's, it's, it's just a really big part of everything. As far as one particular organization, There's so many, but so I'll give you one example. Uh, I'll give you two examples. So the first example is a group called Spruce Up Anchorage. And they're very, very small in that there's just a board and we provide very, very, very low cost management support in the back end, but it's still getting off the ground. And the reason it's still getting off the ground is because of time and availability and funding. And obviously we don't want to spend more hours than can be afforded and all of those different layers. But the idea of the nonprofit came from an individual who's also an owner of a small business, a tree, a tree service in town. And his mother passed away due to breast cancer. And so as a professional arborist, as somebody who is very concerned with the nature of our climate and, you know, losing trees. And then we also had like a big spruce bark beetle outbreak up here. 
he wanted to combine his passion for forestry and connect that with breast cancer. So he started Spruce Up Anchorage, which is a an organization that educates and about sustainable forestry and does giveaways for spruce trees every year. And their fundraising is all directed toward families and individuals experiencing breast cancer. And it's actually one organization that's able to do direct monetary compensation to these individuals that request it. So it's a pretty remarkable thing, but it's so small. So it's right now just not, it's not reaching as many people as I'd like it to. Of course, we are as individuals at EBO Consulting, there's only two of us and it's it's very busy right now. And I'd love to commit more time and energy to this particular organization, but folks can donate to it. They can look it up at spruceupanchorage.org if you're curious. It's just it's just one of those like smaller ent- organizations that touches my heart and I want them to succeed and we want to be a part of their success in that. And I say success in the sense of being known and helping as many as possible. So it's pretty awesome. I think the other one I just want to mention is probably Anchorage Coalition to End Homelessness is one of the organizations we also work with. They are a pretty remarkable entity. They are kind of the lead of the continuum of care, the COC, that's part of the HUD program for housing and homelessness. And they just have a very big role in the community and they have a lot on them and there's a lot of planning and organizing and administrative needs in the back end. It's, it's just a very high functioning, flourishing entity, but they are just always impacted by generally political elements in the community. And it's such a, I guess I bring it up more from, how challenging this the experience can be as well because we do every we're business managers for them as well so it's you know helping with overviewing handbooks we do board support we do meeting support for them so all of those different areas but you can see as we've as we've evolved in our workload with them how challenged and blocked they are from getting things done a lot of the time due to thing out of their control. And it's just like, oh, okay, that has to be delayed because of that. And that has to be delayed because of that. Internally, it's buzzing and everything's happening and everybody's trying so hard to stay in lane and do what they need to do. And yet it's just, it's kind of one of those things you're just waiting on somebody else. And so it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of things that nonprofits are affected by that holds back their progress and politics can be one of those things. I wanted to just ask you, because we're probably to the end of our interview today, but I wanted to ask you what it means to you to have been selected among this initial cohort of Luminaire Award winners. I um, was really kind of overwhelmed by it, to be honest with you. It was something I kind of forgot about, I'll be honest. I, I forgot about the whole thing. And I, and then I got a notice and I think I got a notice that I was a finalist maybe first. And then, yeah, I did. And so I was a little bit like, oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's cool. And then I wasn't sure how I was going to view the results because I had a a board meeting that day. (laughs) So I couldn't be there and I was really gutted. Um, So I was just kind of, you know, not really thinking much of it, but I went back and I found a recording of you announcing the winners and I was on there and I just kind of stopped and I went, no, that's not right. Okay. That's not, he, he, he missed something. (laughs) And so I had to convince myself that it was real. And then I did what I could to share the information with family and friends just to let them know that it was a kind of a cool thing, but it was, um, it really changed the way I I view my work and what I do and how I bring it to the table. And I think that being honored for it is super special and remarkable. I just hope that this means that more people hear about the need for giving back. And if that's the one thing that comes out of this podcast that encourages somebody to go and give some advice or drop a dollar in a, you know, for a local 
organization, whatever it might be, it'll make a difference. And that's what we all have to really aspire to these days. Well, Emily, I couldn't be uh, more thrilled that you joined us today on the show. And congratulations again for winning the being a part of first cohort of winners of the Luminaire for Service Award, the BBB Luminaire for Service Award. As I said, this was an idea I had, and it's seeing you and talk, talking about it uh, obviously warms my heart too, because I know that an idea now has really had an effect on someone, and what you're doing will also have an effect on other people. So with that, I will just again say thank you. And obviously we're going to stay in touch because as part of the first cohort, you're going to be part of what we do with next cohorts. And we're going to build a community of Luminaire for Service Award winners. So we'll talk about that after the show. And to all of our listeners, if you're listening for the first time because you heard Emily was the winner, I want to also <laughs> encourage you to check out some of the other episodes. Uh, we've done more than 112 of these. Uh, we do them every week. And I'm sure that there are a number of them that will inspire you to get out there and, and do some work in the community. Or if you're already doing it and coming across a, a, a tough time, this will get you over that hump too. And I want to uh, just say to anyone listening who who wants to support the podcast you can do that also by going to give.org g-i-v-e dot o-r-g and you can make a donation and we will certainly appreciate it honor it and use it in a way that elevates the human spirit to give more thank you for listening you've just listened to the heart of giving podcast with art taylor be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.